Going on to botanicals. <clears throat> this is my logic and how I would classify some of our key botanicals for cardiovascular complaints. If you were in my morning's class, this is a bit of uh, a repetition. I'll move through these quickly. Nervines, per se, are not directly um, medicines for the heart, but I often find that they're good complements in an overall comprehensive herbal formula for many kinds of cardiovascular complaints. Nervines is an herbal word from history, simply mean a tonic or a tonifier for the nervous system. And herbalists sometimes classify stimulating nervines, sedative nervines, tonifying nervines, etc. I include this on the list of things to consider in your comprehensive formulas because of how often people's hypertension is related to stress or how often our adrenal depletion and thyroid depletion is related to stress or how often um, nervines have an overall vasodilating effect that relaxes the blood vessels and enhances perfusion, circulatory um, effects, sort of so outside of being direct heart muscle effectors or anything to do with the endothelium, these would often be complementary in your formulas. Blood movers is a term from China, and most blood movers that have been spoken of in traditional Chinese medicine, they mean just things that enhance, enhance energy delivery around the body, oxygenation delivery, and for, for um, uh, pathologies that are related to, quote, stuck blood, that could be pain, that could be hyperemia and throbbing and congestion, like a migraine headache. Uh, that could be Raynaud's syndrome. That could be enlarged liver and vascular stasis or portal hypertension. Those would be all, quote, stuck blood. So using from the Chinese philosophy things that just enhance circulatory dynamics or hemodynamics and balance the ebb and flow of blood to all of our cells and tissues are another philosophical category. Once we study herbs that have been placed in that philosophical category, most, quote, blood movers have been found to be platelet anti-aggregators to inhibit thromboxane excess. Thromboxanes I just mentioned a moment ago, that, that is one of the end metabolites of the eicosanoid pathways. Eicosanoids means um, things that are derived from linoleic, linolenic essential fatty acids, Ico means 11 in Latin, and those are 11 carbon fatty acid chains, and the body transforms those into prostaglandins, leukotrienes, thromboxanes. Thromboxanes are so named because they promote thrombosis. They are the most potent vasoconstrictors. They are the most potent um, uh, platelet aggregants, which of course is why they promote thrombosis thrombi or emboli, and when our body cannot make the more desirable prostaglandin 2 series or when we're not eating flaxseed oil or some of those good eicosanoids, our body might um, sort of have an imbalance between the quantity of thromboxanes compared to the quantity of prostaglandins or the more better behaved, you might say. And I don't mean that thromboxanes, we don't need them and they have their their, their beneficial roles, but we, when we have an excess of thromboxanes, some of those diseases from acute migraine phenomena to blood clotting to vascular stasis or, quote, stuck blood from the Chinese vernacular, many of those fats or many herbs that are blood movers can help resolve that chronic tendency. So some of um, thromboxane inhibitors or blood movers, and I do have a slide that we'll get to in a moment, are most of them are hot culinary spices. Cinnamon, cayenne, garlic, onions, ginger have all been shown to be natural platelet anti-aggregators, or another way that the literature often refers to that are PAF inhibitors. That's platelet activating factor. So if you inhibit the activator, it's kind of a polar logic to have a phrase like that, but a PAF inhibitor would also decrease viscosity of the blood or the Chinese idea of stuck blood. So thromboxane inhibitors, most herbs that are traditionally blood movers are thromboxane inhibitors, platelet anti-aggregators. So since all those that I just listed are culinary herbs, we also have a lot of ways that we could in change people's diets to introduce as many thromboxane inhibitors as possible. 
and then also put, do our herbal formulas to make it more and more powerful or more and more aggressive as circumstances might dictate. Um, Anti-inflammatories, um, these could be wide. There's a zillion herbal anti-inflammatories, and some have more of an affinity for the eyes for hay fever patients, and some have more of an affinity for the skin for eczema patients, and some have more of an affinity for the blood vessels. Agents that have the greatest affinity for the blood vessels that um, are receiving the most attention at the present time are red and blue and yellow pigments. Quercetin in its natural state is brilliantly yellow. They all, all these things could be used as dye plants, and they are. Turmeric is very high in quercetin, plus its own um, curcumin is an anti-inflammatory by various different mechanisms, and then especially the red and purple pigments. What's in red wine, the resveratrols. What's in bilberries, the anthocyanidins, and a long list of things similar, the pomegranate juice and the acai berry and all those basically berries, um, and herb, various different herbal berries or herbal bark extracts that have similar pigments to them. Most of those are the most studied to have the affinity for the endothelium to prevent um, placking. Some of the research um, that's been done in animal models is to feed various animals a highly atherogenic diet, meaning to promote atherosclerosis, so various high fat, high sugar, high processed foods, uh, low in nutrients, low in antioxidants, etc., and feed two different groups antioxidant diets, or excuse me, atherogenic diets, and give one group the blue and purple pigments. Both are shown to have elevated lipids, but the group that is given the blue and purple pigments, the lipids have less of an attendant tendency to apply themselves to create plaques on the endothelial walls. So that's also called the French paradox, how the French can eat all the butter and fried and rich foods, but also tend to drink wine with most meals, and can also have elevated lipids, but have less end-stage MIs and less progressive atherosclerosis. So anti-inflammatories, there's a zillion once you start looking at the herbal literature, and we would want to go for the anthocyanidins, such as resveratrol, quercetin, is having the most research for having protectant effects on our blood vessels. Hypolipidemics are another very important category to lower cholesterol. We can do diet, we can do exercise, we can use herbs as part of an overall comprehensive program for people. And then cardiac glycosides, I talked a little bit about at 7.30 this morning, um, about um, those are a category of herbs most specific for actual cardiomyopathies for decompensation for cardiac failure. So a little bit about each of these as my time allows. Um, nervines are muscle relaxing, vasodilating, so these would be complementary. Many herbalists might call these a synergist in a formula, meaning it's not our most important herb for treating hypertension. It might not be the number one quantity in a formula or the number one player, like lead herb in a formula. But many people would greatly benefit from having a nervine or a meditation program and various sort of ways of accomplishing this as a synergist, as a complementary aspect of an herbal formula for that long list of conditions that we're trying to talk about here. So some nervines that have a particular affinity or that I might choose, there might be some several hundred nervines to choose from, some that I prefer um, for hypertension and for heart palpitations, etc., that seem to have an affinity for the nervous system, they ha or the cardiovascular system, they have an affinity because in addition to being nervines, there might be also a beta blocker. Or in addition to being a nervine, they might contain uh, arginine, etc. So Leonoris is a beta blocker in addition to being uh, a nervine. Melissa officinalis um, is a specific for hyperthyroid kind of state type, um, heart palpitations because of its rosmarinic acid content. Rawolfia um, favors the parasympathetic nervous system. So when people are in sympathetic overdrive, not sleeping well, have um, maybe panic attacks as well as um, hypertension, Rawolfia. Rawolfia um, might worsen uh, depression and people prone to depression. So it's more for your anxious um, insomniac patients than it might be for depleted, deficient, depressed patients. 
Um, Pisidia, Jamaican dogwood, is also a, a fairly profound muscle relaxer and anti-anxiety herb. So these are nerving that I use widely in various sorts of hypertension or heart palpitation formulas. Um, Rawolfia, the reason why it causes depression is Rawolfia, um, in addition to affecting parasympathetic sympathetic tone, it inhibits the inclusion of dopamine into synaptic granules, and it, you can induce a Parkinson's-like state um, if you push the dose very high, and it's even used as a research model in some circumstances to, to um, study what substances might treat or prevent um, Parkinsonism. But also, this is the metabolic pathway for noradrenaline. So noradrenaline has a vasoconstrictive and, of course, um, a, engages our sympathetic nervous system. Tyrosine uptake is increased by amphetamines, ephedrine, and caffeine. Obviously, these all have adrenergic-like effects downstream. So this can enhance tyrosine uptake. Tyrosine goes to L-DOPA, L-DOPA to dopamine, dopamine to noradrenaline. Noradrenaline can have downstream effects at the beta adrenergic receptors on blood vessels. Also, if we're um, disrupting dopamine inclusion into synaptic vessels that can also sometimes um, cause mood disorders and depression. So I just kind of screen patients and obviously use it for the type A people and how many of you treat any of those? Um, <clears throat> it's usually easy to find people that benefit from Rawolfia. Melissa